collaborators. People have made themselves car contractors. They give out car documents for people to use to access car maintenance allowance. Once they get their names on the payroll, they send the document back, and that is it. We are going after all such people. Please, if the vehicle does not belong to you, make sure you don't bring it for car maintenance allowance. Meanwhile, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission says all fraudulent names in the public payroll will be taken out. Why should the one who is working be paid and the one who is also not even supposed to be an employee be paid equally? That one must be, must be you know, cleared up. Also tonight, Upper East Regional Immigration Service on high alert following shooting of three of its officers resulting in the death of one as they embark on a manhunt for the gunman who committed the dastardly act. The very people that we are mandated to protect and protect their property, let us see us as enemies. We are on the ground with other system security personnel taking intelligence to help us get at those people, certainly. Meanwhile, Boko Central MP Mahama Ayareda condemns the shooting, urging government to foster peace in Boko. Also tonight, trial of former Cocoa Bot CEO Stephen Opuni to start all over again, six years after it commenced. We have witnessed the freedom of the High Court to resolve the Opuni trial the past six years. This is simply unacceptable. It's not acceptable for such a case to stay at the court for six years when other more complex cases of murder, secession, and offenses brought on the city of the state are more speedily resolved. Also tonight, there is an online foster on the loose in Accra, defaulting unsuspecting victims of thousands of Ghana cities under the guise of giving them apartments. We'll get details of that as his modus operandi involved giving his clients keys to non-existent buildings. And in business, local currency hit 11 Ghana cities against the dollar in terms of quotes coming from the Forex bureaus as market liquidity continues to improve significantly. As analysts are linking this to progress made on the IMF program as well as the three key revenue measures. And in sports, General Secretary of the Ghana Football Association convicted and fined 24,000 cities by an Accra High Court. We'll tell you why shortly. Also tonight, President Paul Kigami of Rwanda declares he's looking forward to retiring after 22 years in office. It is an inevitability uh, that we have to find possible grow leaders and not for me to, to decide who is going to be the next leader after me. I'm looking forward to that. But he's being warned by his Kenyan counterpart. I want to tell you that from our own experience in Kenya, trying to get a successor can be a very disastrous project. And much later, wow, they are going to arrest me. Can't believe this is happening in America. Words of former U.S. President Donald Trump as he's formally arrested in New York. Evans, we have that and more here in tonight's edition of News Now. You may want to join us with your thoughts and comments. It's via WhatsApp 55 Also on all our social media platforms, you can leave us a comment there. I am MFA Apau. And my name is Evans Mensah, still live from the capital here in Kigali, Rwanda. And we start tonight from the Internal Audit Agency, where it has identified a cabal siphoning millions of CDs monthly from the public payroll under a dubious scheme involving internal and external collaborators. The cabal, according to the head of the agency, Dr. Eric Odrosai, are behind undeserved claimants on the payroll and other fraudulent means to take money from the state. Today, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission began an ambitious program to clean the role and ensure that only legitimate employees are on it. Dr. Odrosai tells Joel News those behind the scheme will be unmasked. The indication is that government contribution to SNIT will be on the increase. In SNIT's own books, they may think that government owes them. But when you do the audit well, you realize that government does not owe them after all, or the amount should be lower. There are also instances where SNIT pensions increases unnecessarily because persons who are supposed to be on retirement will be on, they will still be in active service 
So you get SNIT paying their pension, and central government also paying their salary. There are instances where people have made themselves car contractors. They give out car documents for people to use to access car maintenance allowance. Once they get their names on the payroll, they send the document back, and that is it. We are going after all such people. Please, if the vehicle does not belong to you, make sure you don't bring it for car maintenance allowance. DVLA will be working with DVLA for continual justification of ownership of vehicles to enable you uh, get government car maintenance allowance. These are some of the issues in the system. And I think that if all of us, we work hand in hand to clean up the system, government compensation budget will be, to the, it will come to the barest minimum. And probably going into the future, there will be no need for us to go to IMF because we will make a lot of savings on the government compensation budget and free some resources for other development projects. Well, we can hear from the Chief Executive of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Dr. Ben Arthur, who says the exercise will sanitize the public sector payroll and help identify the lapses and inequalities in the benefits and allowances of public sector workers. Uh, there's cooperation. Everybody who has read our law and knows what we do uh, definitely knows that we have the mandate. Maybe those who initially say we don't have the mandate have revised their laws. So possibly the tape you played is, is, is an old one. Because under Section 3B of our, uh, of our Act, mandate us to do so. Of course, even ordinarily, in the natural, we are not able to simply go and say that you have fixed, uh, uh, you have determined uh, benefits, allowances, you've developed salary structures, and therefore we are not interested in how it's being operationalized. So we are, we are able to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, yesterday, we, the first point of call was with the internal audit agency. We signed an MOU with them for us to collaborate and do this jointly. But of course, it was needful that we also, you know, uh, go through their books to ensure that they are also having a very clean sheet. Other than that, that would be very problematic also joining us. Of course, we have also... And, and so you can say, Mr. Arthur, that uh, of all the agencies, at least the first agency, which is the Internal Audit Agency, has been cleared of all fraudulent activities. Is that the case? Definitely. Definitely. But the detailed mm -hmm. findings, uh, we cannot put it in, in the public uh, domain. Well, you can't, you, can. tell me, you, you can't tell me what you found so far, but Mr. Arthur, are you able to tell me what exactly you are looking for then? Uh, in fact, this exercise is a type of exercise that when you come across some anomalies, some of them are, might be genuine errors that you have to correct. Some of them are being misunderstanding of some of the conditions we are determining how it's even being interpreted. So those ones will even assist management to overcome some of these issues. But in general, you know we have done this on a pilot basis before even coming this far. We couldn't just wake up and say that uh, we are going to do a nationwide a payroll monitoring. Well, MFA, it has been close a day now. Let's assess how the first day went with this particular exercise. The CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, Dr. Ben Arthur, joins us on the telephone line right now. Uh, Dr. Arthur, thank you for your time here on Newsnight. Hello, Dr. Arthur. Yeah, we'll try and get uh, Dr. Arthur <laughs> in and, and speak to him about how the first day of the exercise went. Hello, I'm on the line. We do that. We get some clarity on this. Hello. Issue. So thank you very much, Dr. Arthur, for your time here on Newsnight. Hello. Dr. Arthur, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, but your line is very thin. Hello. Okay, let's try. I mean, I know okay, today you, now you started now this exercise. How did the first day go? Hello? So, Dr. Arthur, he's asking how the first day went. Can you hear me, Dr. Arthur? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I don't have a PhD yet, please. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Arthur. So, we're asking how the first day of the exercise went today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the first day uh, has re received uh, very massive cooperation, especially from the first institution that uh, we visited as part of the field work. Uh, we sat down with them, went through all the, of course, we have collected data on them, did the analysis.
after the media had left us, we went into uh, proper technical work, went through that. But of course, uh, some other uh, recommendations that we've made and the are not for public consumption. What is uh, good for the public, we will put it out there. Others, some of them are just uh, corrections of anomalies and the rest. But of course, in general, today too, we have received a uh, very massive cooperation from the head of civil service and that of local government service. Uh, uh, in the coming days, we'll be able to meet all their management for us to streamline things. So, uh, we, we are good. We are good uh, going forward. So, from the updates... At the start of this process, uh, Dr. Arthur, you have uh, I, I don't know whether you honor me with a PhD. He, people are calling me Dr. Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ap apologies there. At the start of the process, Mr. Arthur, there was some resistance from the some of the unions, in particular. No, it, it, How it, 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 I don't get know, but we have never faced any resistance from any uh, union. Initially, when the public announcement was made clear uh, to everybody, of course, we heard in the news that uh, one of the unions uh, had alleged or had alluded to the fact that they could not find uh, where we had drawn our mandate. But of course, uh, through your own platform, you were able to even put it to them. And you quoted uh, Section 3B of Fair Wages and Salaries Act uh, 2007, which is Act 373. Uh, you quoted it the button. So uh, I do not think there is any uh, union or any group of persons who doubt the fair wages uh, mandate to do payroll monitoring. In, in times past, fair wages had even had a uh, memorandum of understanding and collaboration uh, with even audit service. And so it, it's not a new thing at all. Anybody who says that we don't have the mandate possibly needs to avail himself or herself, you know, with the details or be seized with the details of our, of our law. So we have the mandate. And nobody has resisted that. If there is anything at all that I, I may care to report, uh, we received massive cooperation from our colleagues. And in fact, everybody is happy because that is what will also help all of us, you know, in the name of fairness, if indeed uh, somebody is not placed on the appropriate level and you realize that uh, the person is being shortchanged. We should be careful to correct that anomaly. Uh, in times past, we did a bit of piloting uh, before coming full scale. And it was obvious, even some of the unions had even reported to us of some disparities in terms of allowances, in terms of uh, grade levels and the rest. Uh, you remember on your own platform, uh, at some point in time, uh, colleges of education, non-teaching staff members even issued a community and were ready to go on strike because of some anomalies that they, according to them, had detected during implementation. Period. So we've listened to all of this and we believe that the time has come for us to get out there and ensure that if administrators misconstrued our instruction, we are there to help them make sure that it's implemented there. But of course, I will seize this opportunity to also quickly add that if anybody is earning an unearned salary, we will definitely advise, which we have done uh, previously, and I, I, I will beg of you to use your medium to announce to those individuals that if you know you are earning an unearned uh, income, what we want you to do is to quickly take steps and refund, and very soon we'll be making a uh, public with the procedures and the rest where you have to go and deposit those monies and the rest in the in a public account. Uh, if you know you are a ghost worker, uh, the advice is that you advise yourself before we come and fish you out, which we will definitely do. Uh, we have had instances uh, where people uh, who are collecting vehicle maintenance allowance, uh, in fact, well, there's a joke. Uh, in town, but it's, it's, it's a true joke, where uh, our checks with DVLA uh, had, had indicated that 
an individual was collecting a vehicle maintenance allowance with a vehicle number that actually belonged to a tractor. Can you imagine? So when we see some of these anomalies, we take the necessary steps to get the right things done. But of course, if mm -hmm. there are any fraudulent practices, we will have to also take them on and let the appropriate institutions you know, do their work. Benatha, thank you very much. Benatha is the CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Benatha. Well, we head to Boko at this point, and there's heightened vigilance by the immigration service in the area after three of its officers were shot, resulting in the death of one. The regional public relations officer, Deputy Superintendent Martin Tiosi Soye, says a change in security strategy is being initiated to protect remaining officers in volatile Boko after the incident, while Assistant Inspectors Afari, Eric Ayidia, and Philip Motte were in a private vehicle to get food when the unknown gunmen shot at them. Philip Morty, 42, unfortunately died while Assistant Inspector Safari and Ayidia battle uh, for their lives in hospital as we speak. We can hear from the Deputy Superintendent, Tiosi, uh, telling Joy News there's a collaboration with other security agencies to get these culprits. And protect their property, whether see us as enemies or whatever, to the extent that their activities could threaten our lives. Eric, for instance, his case is serious, so he has been transferred to Tamil Teaching Hospital. Lawrence, after Hospital Lawrence, Afari is at the Boko Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, the deceased, the body is also at uh, uh, the mortuary. They are not minor injuries, they are life threatening. Lawrence's own is um, a bit manageable, but for Eric, his own is critical. Okay, they are not scared because it's our mandate. But we become more strategic in perform our daily or our routine duties, both day and night. Uh, personnel will cover each other's back. There will be a single movement of personnel, maybe two groups, three groups. All of these ones who we were in their car going to buy food and they were shot at. The person, uh, another group was behind. They could have combated this uh, callous act. So we will strategize to perform better. Taking into consideration our lives also. For now, they have been arrested. We are on the ground with other sister security personnel taking intelligence to help us get at those people. Certainly, we pursue them, arrest them, and they face the court of law. Well, thankfully, Deputy Superintendent Tiosi Soye joins us live. We are grateful uh, for your time. You are hoping to pursue them, arrest them, for them to face the law. What's the status of that? Are we anywhere close uh, to making these arrests? <coughs> Hello, Mr. Tiosi. Hello. Can you hear me, Mr. Tiosi? Yes, please. Okay, great. So I was asking if we are anywhere near. We were been interacting with you earlier. You mentioned that you're hoping to pursue these gunmen. Are we anywhere near uh, doing that? What's the status of this particular case? For now, every vital information is still a secret for us. Uh, it's our hope that when we keep that within ourselves, we will be able to uh, get to a very good conclusion. Other than that, uh, releasing to the public will not serve us any good. So for now, whatever information we have, we'll keep intact. Uh, whilst working with informers, we understand the job. Mm. But what, what really, from your preliminary investigations, what really led to this particular shooting? Uh, to begin with, there was no any sign of confrontation between those uh, uh, guys and our officers. Nevertheless, the incident happened. Until now, we don't know why it happened. Uh, I think at the end we will arrive at that. But for now, there's no any assigned cause to that. But as it stands now, whilst you continue your investigations, you have men still stationed on the ground. We we'll talk about their safety. What is the assurance? Um, for us, we are trying to perform our work. 
focused, and that's our focus for now. Like I said earlier on, we will re-strategize and become more vigilant. Uh, watch our back and front wherever we find ourselves, as and when we are on the move. Uh, we are dedicated to the work. We ensure that this thing does not happen again in the near future. Mm. Unfortunately, you lost um, Philip Motte, but we are told that Afari and Eric Aidia are receiving attention in the hospital. Can you tell us how they are faring so far? Yeah, the paramedics are doing their best. Uh, Eric Aidia, he is. Uh, a bit serious, so he has been transferred to Tamil Kishu Hospital. The Lara Safari is at the Presbyterian Hospital in Boko. Both have been given maximum attention by the medical teams. Uh, the, their condition is, uh, is, is at no risk for now. Okay. That's the assurance given. Okay. Well, and, and how about uh, Philip Morte's family? Uh, the immigration is in touch with them. What really has been the processing so far? Yeah, they'll be informed. Uh, our bosses in Accra, headquarters, have asked that the body be flown to Accra mm. for uh, always preservation leading to the funeral as and when everything is set to take off. Okay. We're grateful. We'll be following up on this. Uh, we're grateful for your time. That's uh, Tiose Soye, Deputy Superintendent of Immigration there. He speaks for the Ghana Immigration in the area, Evans. And um, the, the MP uh, for the area, mm. Mahama Yariga, has a statement on this uh, particular issue. If you may, I can uh, take that. And um, it's, uh, it came up um, this afternoon and he says he condemns in very strong terms the shooting injuring and killing of some members of the security agencies in Boko and for him it's most reprehensible and should not be repeated and he wants an investigation into the matter and for him it must be conducted and the perpetrators brought to book and on behalf of the people of Boko he's expressing his sincere condolence uh, to the families of the deceased security personnel and extend prayers uh, to the wounded as well so that's um, the statement that um, the MP for uh, Boko Central has just um, issued um, earlier today Mahama Ayariga Evans you're still live here on news night is on joy 99.7 fm i am live from kigali rwanda and in the studio there in accra i am mfa apau now there is an online swindler on the loose in accra defrauding people who want to rent apartments the scammer who operates with other people brazenly takes on suspecting victims to an apartment hands over keys to a non-existing building to the victims and then take an advance payment one of the victims in her early 30s was defrauded of 30,000 cities another man bright Wusi, was duped of more than 10,000 cities marks at the followed bright Wusi to an apartment the online tricks that used to scam in and now reports well, Evans, uh, Maxwell is still um, bringing us all the details right here. He will join us in studio as well with all the details. I'm sure, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like this uh, before, but we've had a number of them thronging uh, the offices today, both at Asisampa and then also here at Joy News, telling us the various stories. And uh, I would want to hear Maxwell on all the details. But if you may, let's head uh, to the courts now. And the trial of former Kokobot CEO, Dr. Stephen Opuni, is to start all over again six years after it commenced well this is the ruling of justice Kwesi Anochijima who has been taxed to hear the case following the retirement of justice Clemens Wanyanuga the court holds the view that a new trial will be in the interest of justice since the records of the court are saddled with a lot of allegations Attorney General Godfrey Yabo Adame in February this year expressed his frustration at the fact that the case had taken too long listen I find highly unreasonable and unfair for so-called high-profile criminal cases involving simple sums of offenses of fraud 
roughly causing financial loss to the state and money laundering to drag on for years in our courts, while similar cases filed against the perceived ordinary member of society are quickly or rapidly concluded, most of the time within about six months to one year. We have witnessed the freedom of the High Court to resolve the Opoli trial the past six years. This is simply unacceptable. Uh, it's not acceptable for such a case to stay at the court for six years when other more complex cases of murder, secession, and offenses brought on the city of the state are more speedily resolved. These developments deepen the injustice and inequity in our society. The judiciary clearly has to play its part. They have to play their part. The judges also, yes, the eradication of corruption. There cannot be a better way of ensuring that corruption does not pay than through the speedy, efficient, and just adjudication of corruption cases, especially the so-called high-profile cases involving politicians and other wealthy businessmen. Outside the courthouse in New York. Well, let's bring in um, a legal affairs correspondent, um, Joseph Akable, joining us uh, with the very latest on this. First, Joseph, at what stage was the case before Justice Wanyanuga retired? Well, in fact, Jennifer, 14 witnesses have testified so far, seven on behalf of the prosecution and seven being called on behalf of Dr. Opony. So the prosecution had closed this case. Uh, Dr. Opony had been asked to also come in and give his testimony, and that was also in session when uh, Justice Onyeluga retired. In fact, he was given an extension after his retirement for six months. And just when about a month to that six months extension to elapse, uh, the AG's office did make an application that uh, the matter be sent to the CJ for a new judge to be assigned because uh, they felt that the matter could not be finished within the month that was left of the six months extension that he was entitled to. Let's talk about the reason that Justice Jima gave for his decision to start the trial all over again after all these years. As far as he's concerned, this is in the interest of justice in that the records of the court are filled with so much allegations. He also makes the point that starting all over again will afford all parties in the case the opportunity to hear from witnesses, including he, the judge himself monitor the demeanor of witnesses which he considers crucial to determining the truthfulness of a witness among other things to enable the courts to arrive at a fair conclusion and so he holds the view that it will be in the interest of justice and fairness for both sides that is the prosecution and the accused person that this trial commences afresh okay well blair uh, this must be good news then for dr Openi's legal team in fact on uh, more than 10 occasions they have tried in several ways uh, to get Justice Clemens Onyemuga off the case. In fact, in one particular instance, I had to deal with a comment Justice Onyemuga had made while performing his traditional role in the Volta region as a chief, uh, where he had commended President Akufado for implementing free senior high school policy. They made an application asking that he recuse himself because that meant that he was touting government achievements, which they believe that this prosecution is in line with government's objectives. And so they wanted him out. They went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that he remains on the, on the case. There was an instance that, again, the Supreme Court ordinary bench actually barred Justice Onyeluga from hearing the matter. The matter went on review, found by the Attorney General. The court now allowed Justice Onyeluga to return again. Even with a six-month extension, that is when he retired. They contested that it went all the way up. Eventually, the court allowed him to return. Then the EG at the final hour would just amount to go now for the first time and that Justice Onyeluga uh, be made up, taken off the case because he cannot complete it within a month. And so for the defense side, they have consistently wanted him out. And now the good news is that uh, due to what the court has decided, he's no longer going to be there. And number two, the new judge has decided to start a trial all over again. Well, Joseph, how no, about the AG, point. though? I mean, we understand that they are not too excited about this particular decision. In fact, uh, the Chief State Attorney, Evelyn Closing, who argued this particular matter in court, uh, did indicate that it was the view of the AG that was unfair to the prosecution for the trial to commence afresh. What our sources within the AG tell us is that um, filing for a review of sorts of this particular decision remains a very viable option that has been considered at this stage.
Well, um, that's our legal affairs uh, correspondent, Joseph Akable. Well, we know we've been following up on another um, story also. Maybe quickly you can fill us in. That's uh, on the management of the University of Ghana. They want a new judge to handle a case uh, that has been filed by residents of the Commonwealth Hall. Tell me more. Well, it looks like uh, we've lost um, Joseph Akable. Joseph, can you hear me? Okay, well, it's just uh, a technical um, challenge there. But um, uh, so basically, uh, the document um, that was filed by lawyers of the university alleges that the current judge, Francis Aubry, uh, was closely associated with the hall while he was a student, and it would not be fair. And Justice Aubry had previously ordered the university from um, implementing its new residence, a reallocation policy that will see the Commonwealth Hall become a facility for freshmen and graduate students. Well, it's time for business. George Riafe, uh, you don't have any interest in Commonwealth Hall, do you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, let's talk uh, business. Let's <laughs> no. Okay, well, coming up in business, uh, local currency hits 11. Ghana cities against the dollar in terms of quotes coming from these uh, forex bureaus as market liquidity continues to improve significantly with analysts linking development to progress made on IMF program and the three key tax revenue measures and the Ghana Revenue Authority finally takes off with a collection of property rates uh, from April 1, 2000 and 23. The business news on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, Alliance Life and Ghana Pay. You're welcome back to business on Newsnight. Now, the Ghana City's good run against the dollar appears not to be ending anytime soon. The rates quoted by banks and forest bureau continue to improve significantly. In terms of reaching some favorable levels, there is more in this report. Based on engagement with some of the bank treasurers, the strong gains made by the Ghana city over the past two days can be linked to improved dollar supply coming from the Bank of Ghana. They also argue that the significant progress made by government in terms of meeting most of the preconditions for securing an IMF executive board approval has also been a major factor. These bank treasurers believe that the renewed investor confidence has also been a major contributory factor. This is due to the fact that government is taking some critical measures, move that could help to deal with the high budget deficits as well as help in reducing the country's high debt levels. Analysts maintain that the Ghana city's position could strengthen further if Ghana is able to secure an IMF program in the second quarter of this year. Sources close to the IMF have indicated that looking at progress made by government, Ghana may secure board approval earlier than initial months projected in the second quarter of this year. Checks by Joy Business shows that even some of the forex bureaus are quoting lower rates than what some of the commercial banks are selling to their retail clients as are today. And that is the business text report. Well, some industry watchers also believe that the current challenge of the dollar on the international market in terms of its losing ground to other currencies might be a factor. I mean, the dollar is not that strong uh, compared to some two months ago. And all these factors are playing into the Ghana City's performance on the local market. The Ghana Avenue Authority has finally taken over the collections of property rates from local assemblies. Joy Business understands that it took off from April 1, 2023. The authority is moving into this space as the various local assemblies struggle to collect these rates. Reverend Dr. Amisha Dawusoma had earlier been explaining to Joy Business what they are doing to aid in the collection of this tax. Basically, what we have done is that there are a number of properties that we have already raised the assessment. We have introduced a common platform that is a system that allows you to be able to populate all the properties in there. And then we are encouraging the, uh, property owners to go online and be able to update their records with any additional properties that they have. And then within that system, we are able to generate rates applicable to your property. You know, the rates differ from um, area to area and as municipality to municipality and then we'll be able to advise the the property owners of their rates at the same time we're also encouraging once this with the platform ready we are encouraging property owners to also go in and if even your rates your applicable rate have not been generated yet mm. you can still even pay in advance 
if you so desire, and then when the rates are situated, we'll be able to get the right figure for your property. Rate. So, and that is the Reverend Dr. Mishada Usoma. He is the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority. And remember that it's no longer the local assemblies that will be coming to you for your property rates, but rather officials that are commissioned by the Ghana Revenue Authority to do these collections on behalf of the local assembly. Let's talk about insurance because some industry or some insurance players are calling for more collaboration with stakeholders within the sector to boost penetration. According to Chief Sales Officer at Glyco Life, that is John Eckersmart, more efforts should be put into various sanitization programs to strengthen and streamline the activities of the sector. He spoke to Joy Business as Glyco Life demonstrated its commitment to claims payment with 15,000 uh, Ghana cities payout to a family of the late military officer Sharif Imoro. It is for you to, to educate the public on what insurance is, what it takes to have an insurance policy, what are the challenges or no challenges, what do they need when there is a claim. Every insurance is very different. If you look at other aspects of insurance, which is motor and life insurance, there are two different things. For life insurance, so far as you pay your premium, when something happens, you don't need any other person to come with you to get your claim. So it makes it very the John Eka Smart, he is the chief sales officer at uh, Glyco uh, Life Insurance, uh, talking over there, giving us some more details in terms of what they are doing with other players to improve insurance penetration there. Now let's talk about the stock market in terms of uh, gains on the market. Prices have been going up quite significantly. Now if you look at the gains that have been made by some of the uh, stocks, it's gone up by over 12 percent. Now the continuous rally of the exchange is underpinned by dividend announcement by some of the listed companies on the market. So it appears that the market is doing quite well in terms of good returns that is offering to some investors that are participating on the Ghana Stock Exchange. And that is quite interesting in terms of the returns that is bringing to these investors out there. And I mean, if I'm interested in looking at the Ghana City and how it's fair, and if this should continue going forward, while we talk about the impact on the larger economy in terms of things stabilizing, you also want to look at prices of petroleum products and also even prices of goods and services. Now there are push for the transport union to also do something about fares and how that could also impact you and I in terms of cost of living. So mm -hmm. the run, the good run, it appears is not ending soon. And maybe earlier Ghana closes a program with the IMF also. We could see some consolidation for the Ghana city as well, MFA. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, George. We have to, we'll go through some of your messages uh, that you've sent in. But Evans, what are we doing next? We are talking about the National Democratic Congress. And as you know, battle lines are now firmly drawn in that ambition to lead the National Democratic Congress. But when it comes to the parliamentary level and the vetting has started for the uh, parliamentary aspirants across the country, three aspirants have so far been disqualified at the vetting of the National Democratic Congress parliamentary slots in the northern region. The three are Dauda Adams, who had put in his bid for the uh, Sanerugu constituency, Bawa Abdul Fatau for the Tamale South constituency, and Sigida Sharif for the Savalugu constituency. However, some of the disgruntled aspirants who have been disqualified have served notice of challenging the basis under which they were excluded from the race. Let's take a listen to Bawa Abdul Fatau, who was hoping to unseat former minority leader Harun Edrisu. Everybody. As I enter the vetting room, I was having hope that I'm also coming to respond to questions. And all of suddenly, what they are telling me, I was not getting their position. And while I was not getting it, I decided to request them to give me a written ruling or a verdict of their vetting. And when they gave me the ruling, I saw that what they said was not exist. They said I claimed I admitted that they I was three years in the past. I mean, how would you say that? Three years 
coming to contest for a member of parliament, that is untenable. So I disagree with them. And then they wanted to tie that with my regi biometric registration with the party, with my activeness in the party. And I said, no, you don't do that. So we had not even gotten there. They were trying to look at the longevity that was mentioning in the guidelines. And I also drew their attention to a constitutional provision in the constitution. And the tool where the nature wasn't fair. And they think that me, my understanding of it is not the, the true meaning of the constitution. So what's the way forward now? For the guidelines of, of the primary, there are other remedies that we may exercise our right as members of this great party. Which is? We appeal the decision. You earlier indicated that uh, there is a grand agenda to ensure you don't achieve your parliamentary ambition. That is what I felt. Per what the behavior of, 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 of the panel and the people around there. Because otherwise, if you have anything, allow us to go. Whoever takes the seat, fair enough. That is the game. That is democracy. That is fairness. Well, the Northern Regional Secretary of the Party, Mohammed Abdul Salam, has been speaking about the agitations. He said it is to be expected, considering the high expectations. On day two, we took 21 aspirants to move from six constituencies, just as yesterday, 21 from six constituencies. So the total has had 42 aspirants having been vetted, with three not being able to meet the eligibility criteria. Three aspirants, um, one from Savangu, one from Sangaru, another from Tamari South, um, were unable to meet the eligibility criteria. Yes. So as it stands now, three people have been disqualified out yes. of 42. Your party people are accusing the vetting committee of deliberately disqualifying those you think are contenders for some of the sitting areas. Are you surprised? If we were to disqualify them, we would have disqualified everybody and allow the sitting MPs to go and Is that not the case? Yes, but we are saying that if you see that this person is capable of unseating one, then you target the person. But it means if they are the delegates who are making the decision, there are still people in the race that they can still make a choice without it. Yes. These complaints are normal with disqualifications. Well, we're joined on the telephone line right now by Martina Bugri, who is a Northern Regional Correspondent. Martina, apart from uh, Bawa Abdul Fattah, who we had earlier say that he and his lawyers will be appealing the decision, you've been speaking to the other aspirants who have been disqualified. How are they taking this? Yes, I tried to speak to um, the, the lady from Pavilion, but that they are, it's a party issue, and when they get to Savilibu, um, they would sit And the other one had petitioned, I'm told, the committee, and so he's waiting for the outcome of um, that petition, we are told. So basically, these were the things and, and that came up when I, I, I spoke to some of them at the grounds there. And we know uh, Tamale is a hotbed of uh, political activity uh, in a way. And these people who have been disqualified will have their own followers. Is it leading to increased tension among the NDC ranks in the northern region? Yes, for so those they disqualified, um, they, they, their supporters stayed on at the party office. When I tried to film them, and um, they tried to they warn me they would smash was very upset and they stayed on um, forcing the police to be at post until they came out to uh, speak to the candidate, the aspirant, and then he decided to move out and then his followers went with him. But those from Savili who were very agitated and they had threatened that they were going to burn the party office, but their leadership were able to calm them down and then they moved them out of the premises of the party to, um, and then they left. So I must say that, yes, tension is beginning to build up. I heard some even saying that with what is going to force them to vote, not to vote for the party because they are preferred candidates. That's some of the sentiments that I heard people make at the ground there. 
Martina, thank you very much. From the northern region, let's come to the greater Accra region, where one of the disqualified aspirants for Medina, Prince Moses Zakaria, has vowed to contest as an independent candidate after the party's vetting committee disqualified him. Now, the claim he served as a general secretary of the United Front Party, raising questions about loyalty. But the story is different in the Upper West Region, where 30 aspirants have successfully been vetted to contest for 11 parliamentary seats in the region. Let's bring in our regional correspondent, Rafiq Salam, who has been looking at the contests in the West Central and West constituencies. Well, Evans, um, Rafiq Salam's uh, report uh, will bring that um, to you uh, shortly, but um, it looks like it's a good time now uh, for us to do sports. I know the NPP have also been busy today, and the chairman of the party, uh, Stephen Intim, has been addressing uh, the media weeks after the NDC tore into President Akufuado's State of the Nation address, describing it as one filled with falsehood and not reflecting the realities facing the Ghanaian people. We'll get to hear uh, from Stephen Intim shortly on that. But let's bring in Musbao uh, with the latest from the world of business. I'm sure Evans is dying to say hello to you. Yeah, the world <laughs> of sports, actually. Yes. Uh, well, the Ghana Football Association uh, General Secretary Prosper Harrison Addo, he's been convicted by an Accra High Court for contempt. He's been sentenced to a one day in jail and fined 24,000 Ghana cities. And uh, as a result, uh, but the lawyer, we understand, will spend no time behind bars after the fines were promptly paid. Now, the contempt was filed by Ashanti Gold after the FA went ahead to commence the 2022-23 Bet Bar Premier League despite an interlocutory injunction imposed on the season. Uh, Non-executive council member Sheikh Tofik Senu was also convicted by the court and that uh, two men, we understand, of course, will serve one day jail sentence and have all paid the fine which uh, prevent them from seven uh, from being behind bars and uh, what we understand also is that Ashanti Gold are unhappy about the ruling by the court and have indicated they might pursue this beyond the Accra High Court. Well, MFA, also in Europe, Chelsea will be engaging Liverpool in some nine minutes from now after the dismissal of head coach Graham Porter. Bruno Salter is the one who is taking charge of the team at the moment. I mean, wait to see what the fortunes of Chelsea will be like. That's all for sports, MFA. Thank you very much, Ms. Bao. We head to the camp of the NPP briefly now, Evans. And of course, I've been telling you earlier about a national chairman of the NPP, Stephen Intim, accusing his colleague from the NDC, Johnson Asiedun Ketia, of embarking on a deliberate campaign of propaganda and refusing to acknowledge the effect of COVID-19 on the country's economy. We can hear from Stephen Intim. Ghana's economy was the toast of the world until COVID-19. Before 2020, Ghana was hailed among the fastest growing economies in the world. But COVID-19 disrupted the growth momentum of the economy, and later the Russian-Ukraine war also came on board. As a result of these factors, our economy, which was among the fastest growing economies in the world, started to, uh, started to accelerate in 2020, and the government has committed everything in its toolkit to regenerate it. Ladies and gentlemen, the ravaging impact of COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war on the global economy are visible all around us. But somehow, the NDC has refused to acknowledge nor admit this fact to continue misinforming Ghanaians that this government has mismanaged our economy. So, the NDC's press conference was merely a repetition of their denial of the impact of COVID-19 and the Russian-Ukraine war on the economy. The NDC hopes that by consistently propagating this blatant misinformation, it will get enough Ghanaians to come to believe it. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, I'm concerned about this deliberate misinformation campaign by the NDC to deny the impact of COVID-19 and the yeah, Russian-Ukraine war on Ghana's yeah, economy. And many others are concerned about increasing taxes. These real bread and butter issues made it difficult for anyone to believe it is not the government's fault that we are going through these hard times. This is the opportunity that
Well, correspondent De Kweku Asante, what's at this event and joins us on the telephone line right now? Kweku, the MPP chairman also did not mince words in describing the NDC party as not only bad managers of the economy, but bad researchers as well. And um, so, someone in team sought to pick on the NDC's claim that if COVID-19 was affecting Ghana, then why was not affecting Cote d'Ivoire? The chairman then gave us some figures that suggested to him that COVID-19 had brought about the same challenges to, 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 to Ivory Coast. And he started to suggest that if NDC did some more research, some facts would have become apparent to them. Hmm. And quickly, let's also talk about this often referenced subject of reduction in the size of government. What's mm. been the MPP's response to the NDC accusing government of ignoring calls to downsize and cut expenditure? Well, so according to Chairman team, the MPP started administration in 2017 with about 126 ministers. But because the president had listened to Ghanaians and the concerns they had about his size of government, he has reduced that to 86. And so he says that the potential for NDC to continuously have on the same statement that the government was bloated simply isn't accurate. Well, thank you very much, Kweku. And I'm pretty sure this subject of the true state of the nation will go away. But I believe you, the audience, have the final say on what the actual state of the nation is. MFA. Well, we'll stay in Kigali where you are uh, this evening bringing us uh, news live. And President Paul Kigami of Rwanda says he's looking forward to retiring and handing over power after 22 years in office. He's been speaking at a press briefing with his Kenyan counterpart, William Ruto, in the Rwandan capital, Kigali. He told journalists a secession plan is being actively discussed. Well, Evans, you were there at this briefing. Tell us more. Of course, and this obviously is a big deal uh, for the international community, for the rest of the continent. Many have described him as a, a benevolent dictator. And, and here was the man himself, for the very first time in a long time, publicly saying that he is ready to step aside. Not only so, that he has no interest in appointing who succeeds him. Listen. On the transition part for... Uh the person in the present of Rwanda uh, is, uh, again, another issue. I, I, I fully understand what you are talking about. Uh, it's an issue that has to be addressed. Uh, sooner or later, I had the opportunity to discuss it with my members of the party. Uh, but it is an inevitability uh, that we have to find First of all, grow leaders, and not for me to, to, to decide who is going to be the next leader after me. I think that also uh, is not necessarily uh, co co correct. But create uh, an environment, circumstances, uh, that and he's also looking forward to leaving office then. Let's talk about it. Yes, he is looking forward to leaving office. And guess what, MFA? He's saying that when he leaves, he's, he will consider taking up the job of a journalist, just like me and you. Really? Okay, let's hear him. Uh, but the situation is being looked at, has been looked at, in fact, for since 2010, we had this discussion within a party within our country. It's not the first time it's not the first time it has come up. Maybe it's not even going to be the last time. Uh, but life has to go on. I'm sure one day I may join the journalism in my old age. So and then we can talk about that past that involved me. I'm looking forward to that. Well, old journalist uh, there, Kigami. Well, Evans, <laughs> on the subject of leaving office, um, he's been uh, t telling us about this. But he's been standing uh, beside Kenyan President William Ruto, who has his own issues back home over disputed elections. What was his reaction? His reaction was interesting, MFR Pao. As far as he's concerned, um, Paul Kagami should be very careful about being anxious, about being eager, rather, about being eager to, to leave office because uh, succession plans can be dangerous. I, I heard you uh, talk about uh, 
why don't you look for a successor? I want to tell you that from our own experience in Kenya, trying to get a successor can be a very disastrous project. <laughs> because um, it may not be the person the people want. So I, I think that's an area that requires uh, much more than identifying somebody and saying, uh, telling the population this is the person. What President Kagame has done from where I sit is commendable. I think he has provided sufficient mentorship to enough people. Well, and um, Evans, on the subject of leaving office, uh, Mr. Kigami, we know, has just been elected for another five-year term as chairman of his political party. So what does that mean, considering he's now openly talking about a succession plan? Well, that's a subject that we'll be exploring subsequently. But uh, to the U.S., uh, briefly, before we head off, interesting times, indeed, that we're in. Donald Trump, former U.S. president under arrest, after arriving at a court, we'll be looking forward to this day uh, when we head that he's been indicted well he's been making some comments before uh, heading to the courts today i'm sure you'll be monitoring in there as well what's the talk uh well i think everybody else is uh, paying attention to that and uh, i was seated in front of uh, william ruto of kenya and Paul Kagami. And we're talking about how the West sometimes wants to dictate to us they have their own issues they should focus on i've just been looking at the feed here and donald trump has pleaded not guilty now to 34 felony charges, pretty unprecedented historically in the U.S. Mm. Well, that's how we wrap up uh, tonight's edition of Newsnight.